Hey everyone. Today I figured we could have a look at this beautiful map that I got back in London at the start of summer. This is the Stanford's map of the Siberian Railway, which you can see up here. The Great Land Route to China and Korea. And up here in this corner we have a little stamp where it says March 7th, 1904. And that is incidentally when the Siberian Railway was opened. It was not yet completed at the time, but it was opened and the first trains began their journey. The map is a little difficult to read, I want to say up front. We're going to try and decipher some bits and pieces, but I brought one of my other atlases so we can combine it with some maps that might be a bit clearer. The Trans-Siberian Railway starts all the way over here in Moscow and then for the first part you can see the red lines here these are the rail connections but we don't have all the individual stops listed just yet so we're coming up here to the Ural Mountains And then we're moving across an area that is commonly known as Siberia. It's not all Siberia, but that is a bit more complicated than what we want to get into today. That's a different story. So here we're going through part of China and then we're arriving at Vladivostok. This is here, Japan Sea, and then we're by the Pacific. One of the really difficult parts especially here around Lake Baikal you can see that the area is quite mountainous and getting across the lake was not easy I was actually surprised that even though this is from 1904 you can already see this line around the shore here in the south because at the start the rail lines would stop on either side and then the whole train would be loaded onto a ferry which would cross the lake in about four hours and then they would put the whole train back on the tracks and continue the journey. In winter, when the lake was frozen, they would also try to carry it across with horses. But one of the locomotives sank, so that wasn't ideal. The Trans-Siberian Railway still largely follows the same pattern with some changes. There's a route here that stays within Russia and also some more northern routes, but we'll get to that a bit later. 
before I start, I think one of the questions is why it was built in the first place. You did have connections before you had the Siberian route, which was also called Moscow Highway or Great Highway, and because a lot of tea was transported from China, also known as the Tea Road. And it largely followed the same path. So it was also here on the southern border of Russia or the Russian Empire at the time and went from China to the European part of Moscow. And before that, mostly river routes were used. And if you think back on the video that we did on Novgorod, so the beginnings of the Kievan Rus, we would have been up here in this corner with Lake Lagoda, and I said, you have a lot of rivers that connect the Baltic to the Black Sea, which allowed the Vikings and other merchants to travel across the land. For one, this land is much, much bigger, so obviously you would need a lot more rivers. But one issue with Siberia is that the rivers mostly run towards the Arctic and they don't really allow for east-west travels as easily. So we have the Yenisei here running north. We have the Oop over here also running north. And here from Yakutsk, this is the Lena, running north towards the Arctic. And there are some branches that you could use that run east to west, like here the Angara allows for some traveling. And in the Eastern part, we have the Amur, if I can find it, right here, there we go. But again, that's a relatively small part, all things considered. So traveling was difficult and the Russian Empire is quite large and that obviously meant that a railway was supposed to make things a lot easier and a lot faster. Construction started in 1891 so we're still in the time of the Russian Empire As we have written here across the entire map. There's still a Tsar, there's no revolution yet, no Soviet Union, we're still in a monarchy. And it was also opened during the monarchy, 1904, as I said. The whole journey from Moscow to Vladivostok is 9,280. 89 kilometers long and it goes through eight time zones and today it takes six days to complete for passengers. It's not the longest single continuous journey but it is part of the longest so you could use part of it to travel further to Korea, to Pyongyang from Moscow, or you could travel from Kyiv, which is not on here on this map, all the way to Vladivostok, which is also a bit longer. <laughs> I don't know if you'd necessarily want to make that journey 
I think there's a point where I'm spending so much time on the train. It gets a bit tedious. All right, let's pick the other map for a bit. So this is the Polska Historical World Atlas that we've used before. And there's one great map that shows the expansion of Russia. In 1462, well still the area around Moscow right here. and only then started to expand here across the border to Finland, the Kola Peninsula along the Arctic across the Ural and then here down to the Caspian Sea and to where St. Petersburg is today You can see here, the lighter the color gets, the further it spread. We then have a very rapid expansion all the way to the Bering Sea, to the Amur. And here we have today's border to China and Mongolia. And again, not too long to have an expansion southwards and south again to the border to today's Afghanistan and you also have influence on Persia this will happen in the 16th century 17th and we are sort of the 17th to the 19th century. Manchuria was briefly part of Russia as well, but only for five years, 1900 to 1905. And here we have a dependent state. The slide pink is the sphere of influence around 1914 and we've already said here are the rivers running north I think you can see them quite nicely on this map the Amur runs roughly along the border to China we have the Baikal Lake right, we also have the year when the different cities were founded so that gives us a nice idea how quick this expansion was if you look here we have all sort of early 16th century, 1542 and then we get into 1593, 1585, 1587 here along this line then early 17th century, 1601, 1607, 1619 but further 1655, we're here in the middle of the 17th century the ones up here a little younger from the 30s and the easternmost city also says 1649 both of them here in the east it's a really rapid expansion less than a hundred years between these two places for Kamchatka we have the early 18th century right here and then the region around the Amur is 19th century 
for Vladivostok, I think this is quite interesting. This is a really young city from 1860. And if you look at photos of it, it looks pretty much like any other European city uh, with this typical uh, Fölsiecle architecture that you would find in Vienna, in Paris, sort of these beautiful facades. Looks in a way very familiar. They're on the other side of a continent, so I thought that was really fascinating to notice. But what you can see is that this connection is pretty much the main connection. Pastumsk, Krasnoyarsk, Irkutsk, here to uh, Chita, Nechinsk. And then here we have the second route that I mentioned earlier. So this here, after Chita, would go through Manchuria to Vladivostok. And as you can imagine, having the only connection to Vladivostok run through a foreign country was something that didn't feel too good. Yeah, it didn't sit quite right. So quite quickly it was decided to build another train line up north of north of the border that stayed in Russian territory. The one that runs through China is still used today, however, not for the Trans-Siberian Railway, because there's one issue. Russia uses a different track gauge compared to China, so you would have to switch once when you cross the border and then a second time when you cross the border again, which is not really useful. So in a way it's easier to go around. But the track does exist and you can use it. But since this route is still pretty close to the border, it was eventually decided to create another one further north. And I can't see it on this map, but basically it diverges after Krasnoyarsk, over here, and then takes a northern route, north of the Baikal Lake, to the sea. The city that it goes to is called Sovietska Yakovan. I don't think it's on this map either. It only goes to 1917 after all. Might be a newer city. This northern line is called Baikal Amur Main Line or Short Ban. That's how you often find it if you look for videos. And it was only completed in 1991. Construction was thought of quite early, so you can find plans dating back to the 30s. But it was only in the 70s that construction really started under Brezhnev, who called it the construction project of the century. And um, compared to the trans siberian Railway, he did not want to use convicts to build it. So, I guess that is an important point as well to make. Let's see if we can find it here. We have Krasnoyarsk. There it is. Here you can see it. Crossing the Elena here. And uh, can't find the final destination, but that's okay. We have an idea where it goes to. 
Nastasia was built 74 to 89. And the information I found said it was completed in 91. So there's some, some uncertainty there, I guess. This is also a nice map because it tells us how important this connection is. You can see that the industrial areas differentiate here in color, the darker one is prior to 1917, the lighter is 17 to 39, and then the light pink one is after 39. And you can see that they're all sort of roughly in the area of the Trans-Siberian Railway a bit further south here but especially in Novosibirsk is the most important city in Siberia you can also see Yakutsk being an important centre and the connections north that there are have not really developed the land further north. In general, you can add that the Trans-Siberian Railway did not quite deliver what uh, people hoped for. There was this idea that it would bring in a lot of people to Siberia, that it would sort of help with development, that there would be uh, lots of new towns springing up but it's still a very remote area and you can imagine taking days on the train to get back to maybe where your family lives it is a bit far and not too inviting plus the weather is quite cold and a bit harsh even the Vladivostok here, for example, lies at the, the same height as Florence. It's much, much colder since you don't have the Gulf Stream that brings in warmth to the Mediterranean. So there's no um, Italian summers here. Nonetheless, between 1904 and 1916, 5 million people moved into this area here. And that's still quite significant, considering that before that, there were only about 5 million people in the area, so it doubled. It's not nothing. And of course, the same thing happened with the BAM the Baikal Amur main line. However, since it coincided with the collapse of the Soviet Union, a lot of the projects that had been planned for the area that were meant to be developed now that the uh, railway was complete fell flat and some of the towns that were created have turned into ghost towns. You did have some Tourist activity, both on the BAM as well as on the Trans-Siberian Railway Which I guess has fallen flat these days as well One particularly nice area is here around the Baikal Lake This is called the Circum Baikal Railway This area here and today it's not used for the Trans-Siberian Railway anymore It just connects some of the towns And was open to tourists And the area is just incredibly beautiful The Baikal Lake per se is stunning It is 
that five, six hundred kilometers long and one and a half kilometers deep. So very, very, very deep. And an important freshwater reservoir. And of course, you can imagine how difficult it was to cross it, given these depths. The area east of the Baikal Lake posed some difficulties as well when the railway was built. This is something we can see quite nicely here on this map. If we look a bit further west, we have the Ural Mountains, but especially the European part is really, really flat. And this area here isn't too mountainous either. But the closer we get to the Baikal Lake, the more mountainous it gets. And here, the trans region is really, really mountainous. They had to build a lot of tunnels. They had to find ways to allow for the locomotives to make their way through. And just building this area was three times more expensive than expected and a lot more expensive than any of the other regions. And you can see here that to the south these mountains continue as well as to the east and that what we think of as Siberia, which would be the far east here, gets continuously more mountainous. I really like how these ranges are added here. This is really lovely. And if we're looking a little south, over here we can even see Palmyra. And when I had a look at it earlier, I also found the Hindu Kush. But I can't make it out right now. That's one of the issues with this map. It's just so dense, or so much information that it can be a bit difficult to make things out. Here's Kunduz. So we're really high up here. And there it says Hindu Kush. We have Mongolia here with the Gobi Desert. And because I mentioned earlier that we have this trans manjurian branch, there's also a Trans-Mongolian branch that connects Russia to China. But it's not on here yet. And I'm not completely sure which area it runs through. Here a little further south, you can also see this red line where it says a Russian project. But I'm not sure what that refers to. Whether that is the sphere of influence that we saw in the other atlas. Or something more concrete. We have Turkestan here, the 
RLC the Kirky step. But again, it's not easy to read. There's a pen and a western I don't know what the second part is of that expression here. Some western part. But again, really lovely rendering here of the mountains. And at the time, I think that was probably really fascinating to see, especially if you did go on the train, which was possible from quite an early stage. Maybe someone took a map like this with them and checked the different cities or towns that they went through and looked out across the flat areas north or south, maybe try to make it the different mountain ranges. And follow along with their train journey. But I think our exploration for today ends here. With this part of Central Asia, all the way to the east. Hope you enjoyed this map and I'll see you again next week.